So one morning, Adam was walking with his son. This was a while after the, the exile from Eden. And he's walking with him, and they pass by the entrance to the garden in the distance. And his son sees the, the fruit trees looking really delicious and a beautiful rivers, pristine flowing rivers flowing into it. And he, he turns to Adam and he says, Dad, did you really live here one time? And Adam turns to his son and said, Yes, until Mom and I ate ourselves out of house and home. <laughs> Have you heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Dead Sea Scrolls, yeah? It's a couple of, couple of nods. It's a big collection of manuscripts, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of them Old Testament manuscripts, uh, which date back to the first century. Now, this was a big find back in the 1930s because before that, most of the things were from the 10th century. And so this was a huge find in terms of biblical scholarship and knowing uh, earlier uh, datings of things. Where were they found? Well, they were found near the Dead Sea. Obviously, they're called the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were found in a, in, a, in, a, in a cave in a valley by a small little shepherd boy looking for his lost sheep. So he's looking for his lost sheep, and he's going through the caves, and he's throwing stones in to try to scare the sheep out. And he, and he, he hears something break, and he goes in, and there's all these jars, sealed up jars with all these manuscripts in them. And those become the, the, what are called the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was a great find. A great find that came from a very strange place. Today we're going to return, we're going to look at our monthly series on disciples, on the 12 disciples of Jesus, on his 12 closest followers. And we're going to talk about one guy who thought that same thing about Jesus, that coming from a strange place was a great thing that came from a strange place. And this disciple is known by two names, just like we've seen before. In Mark, Matthew, and Luke's Gospels, he's just mentioned in a list of 12 disciples as Bartholomew. But when we look at John's Gospel, Bartholomew is nowhere to be found. But there's a guy named Nathaniel in John's Gospel. And so here in John's Gospel is where we get to introduce to Nathaniel Bartholomew. Philip went to look for Nathaniel and told him, We have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph, from Nazareth. All right, so we've seen Nathaniel. And remember, we've seen other disciples with multiple names before. We've seen Matthew, we've seen Peter have multiple names. So Bartholomew is a Hebrew surname. It's a name that means son of Tolmai or son of Ptolemy. When you see the, the, the bar, it means son of in Hebrew. And so Nathaniel means God has given. And so this disciple is Nathaniel. Bartholomew, Nathaniel's son of Toma, just as they said Jesus, son of Joseph. And so when we talk about Nathaniel and Bartholomew, we're talking about the same person, the same disciple. And it's this person who will come to the realization in, in his story that, that great things can come from strange places. So you see, Nathaniel's first introduced to Jesus by Philip. We see that here. And in the list of the 12 disciples in the other Gospels, they're linked, Philip and Nathaniel, as well as in early church history and some of the, some of the legends about the apostles after the, the Gospels. Philip and Nathaniel, or Bartholomew, are always linked together. And so here in John, we find Philip running to tell Nathaniel, we have found the Messiah. We found Jesus. And Philip and Nathaniel paper were maybe they were best friends, right? Because you, you run to tell something that matters to you to the one who's closest to you, somebody that you that you really care about. You run and you tell them about this thing that you found. And so Philip runs and he tells Nathaniel, and here we get, just like Andrew running to tell Peter, you get uh, Nathaniel introduced to Jesus. And so when Philip tells him, he's skeptical. And we'll see that in a minute. It continues in his story. And so in, in his brief moment on stage with Jesus, he says two things. He makes two statements that we know about him, tells us a lot about him, and tells us a lot about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. So here is his initial response to the news that Philip has found the long-awaited Messiah. Nazareth exclaimed Nathaniel. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip replied. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Well, Nathaniel's response shows a bit of prejudice, a bit of skepticism. 
And you go, why would Jesus choose someone who's so biased against him from the outset just based on where he's coming from? And then you go, what's the root of Nathaniel's bias? What good could come from Nazareth? What's the, what's the root of this bias against Nazareth? Well, we're not sure exactly of all the extent of his prejudice, but there's, there's some things we know. Nazareth was not a special town. There's nothing special about Nazareth. It was a rough place to live, a lot of uneducated people. It was a small little town, a uh, very small population, about 200 at the time of Jesus. Uh, it had very few resources of anything to speak of. It had uh, a lot of sickness and disease because of its area. So, so Nazareth was more or less the, the navel of the belly of Galilee. It was not a place that you want to call your hometown, okay? Uh, perhaps there's a little bit more to it as well. There was a neighboring town close to Nazareth. It was called Cana. Well, you recognize Cana. It was the place where Jesus first turned the water into wine, uh, his first miracle recorded in John. Well, John tells us later in chapter 21, verse 2, that Nathanael was from Cana of Galilee. And so they're, they're very close towns together. You can kind of see on this, this map... My little thing's not working at all. This thing's done. Oh, now it works? What? Back. Let's try again. Okay, so Cana and Nazareth, um, up here at the top in the red circle, you see the red, very close towns together, neighboring, neighboring little towns, uh, way north of, of Jerusalem. Cana and Nazareth are, are, are kind of uh, neighboring towns with, with a rivalry. They're both sort of insignificant little towns, um, and, and perhaps Cana was even more insignificant than Nazareth. You can kind of see Nazareth is sort of on a, on a road between Lebanon and Jerusalem. It's on kind of a main road. Cana is kind of off the beaten path a little bit, and so uh, Cana is kind of even a, a little bit less than than, than uh than Nazareth. It's sort of like Hearn and Franklin in some respects, right? This, this, this rivalry, this sort of town rivalry that's going on. And so there was some built-in feeling of superiority uh, with, with this, with this Cana-Nazareth thing. Of course, Jesus is accustomed to this kind of this kind of response to Nazareth, right? Even in his hometown, even in Nazareth, the people try to throw him off a cliff when he preaches in the synagogue. So this is something that, that he's used to with this prejudice against Nazareth. But there's more. Nazareth is also not a very spiritually significant place. It, it, it doesn't have anything in, to do with in, in the Old Testament to speak of. Nathaniel must have known this. He must have known. He's a, he's a young Jewish boy raised in, the, in reading the Torah, raised to understand this stuff. He must have known, well, wait a minute. The Messiah is supposed to come from Bethlehem. Not supposed to come from Nazareth. He's supposed to come from Bethlehem, not some backwoods little place in Galilee. And so he makes this statement. He makes this statement, what good can come from Nazareth, thinking that he, 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 he knows this is just, this is not happening. And there have been a lot of statements like that in the company of Nathaniel. A lot of experts over time have made statements that have been proven horribly wrong at some point. And so we're going to look at a few of those, try to guess what these people are talking about, okay? I'm going to tell you a, tell you a statement, and you're going to try to guess who they're talking about. The president of Decca Records in 1962 says this. We don't like their sound, and guitar music is on their way out, on its way out anyway. The Beatles. The Beatles. Wow, good job, the Beatles. IBM in 1959 said, the world potential market for this product is 5,000 at most. Computer. Not computers. Calculator. What? Calculator. No. They said it to the eventual founder of Xerox. The copy machine. The copy machine. Jim Denny, the manager of the Grand Ole Opry, said to a young man in 1954, You ain't going nowhere, son. You ought to go back to driving a truck. Elvis Presley. Tris Speaker, a baseball expert, 1919, said, Taking the best left-handed pitcher in baseball and converting him into a right fielder is one of the dumbest things I ever heard. Babe Ruth. There you go. Yes, Babe Ruth. Mary Somerville, the pioneer of radio educational broadcasts in 1948, said, It won't last. It's a flash in the pan. TV. TV. Yes, TV. Rutherford B. Hayes, the U.S. president in 1872, said, It's a great invention, but who would want to use it anyway? Charlie, good job. Telephone. The telephone. Alexander Graham's telephone. One last one. Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? 
Yeah, I'd say Nathaniel's in some, some pretty infamous company of quickly making a bad call here, making a bad call, but he had some good reason to, to reject Nazareth. We've already talked about the insignificance of Nazareth. There are no prophecies linking the Messiah with Nazareth. Uh, and so his, his, in his response, his, his skepticism, his prejudice has some basis of, of, of reality. But it shows us something about Nathaniel, so just something else. He knew the scriptures. He knew the scriptures well enough that when Philip said the, the Jesus of Nazareth, he, he automatically went, wait a minute, that's not right. He knew the scriptures by the identifier of he's coming from Nazareth. There are 456 Old Testament prophecies. And Nathaniel's familiar enough with what he had been reading and studying to know that something's screwy here. He knew the scriptures. He knew the scriptures. Do, do we know? Do we know? Are we able to, to see when somebody says something, wait a minute, that doesn't jive very well. He's been studying it. He's been looking at it from, from the time that he's a, a young man. How well do we know that? Are we able to say when somebody says, I don't, I don't know. So, so when Nathaniel, he, 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 he goes to follow Philip, and, and his expectations are really low, right? He's got prejudice against Jesus, and, and it's based on his knowledge and on his prejudice. And understand, when prejudice is combined with a, with a knowledge of the Scripture, that can be a dangerous combination. If it's not left unchecked, you've got racial, religious, social prejudice, and it's hard to squash. And we do that too, right? We do what Nathaniel did. We make assumptions about individuals, about nations, about groups of people. And then we search the scriptures to try to justify the prejudices, right? Nathaniel didn't let his prejudice overpower his search for God. He didn't say, oh, I'm not going there because that guy. No, he got up and he went with Philip. Because his search for God and his heart, his authentic heart, was more powerful, more important than his prejudice has. So he gets up and he goes. And imagine what Nathaniel's response is when Jesus says this to him. He comes to him and he says, what in the world is going on with my thing? Technology. Yeah, yeah technology. Talk about see the, the Xerox machine and the, tech and the TV. It's going backwards. He says, now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. How do you know about me? Nathaniel asked. What a shock. Jesus says, here's a genuine son of Israel. And he says, how do you know me? How do you know me? Jesus declared that he knew the heart of Nathaniel. But look at what he focused on. Nathaniel had just said, oh, what good could come from Nazareth? Jesus didn't focus on, I heard what you said. Mm -hmm. He could have said that. He could have said, I heard what you said about my hometown over there. No, he said, you are a genuine Israelite, a, a complete integrity. He focused on Nathaniel's authenticity, that Nathaniel was, uh, was full of authenticity. He didn't just study the scriptures, but he lived them too. And this was something in short supply in this day. Authenticity was in short supply in Jesus' day. There were a lot of Israelites who were in name only. They were seeds of Abraham. They were Abraham's children. They had religion, but it wasn't real for them. A lot of these guys, they, they offered the sacrifices of repentance, but they weren't really willing to change their lives. They came to the temple to worship, but it was just ritual. It was just hollow ritual. In public, they were praised, and in private, they were ungodly. Jesus spoke about these guys. He had some of the harshest words that you hear him say in the Gospels for hypocrites like this. In Matthew 23, he rails against religious leaders for this very thing, not being authentic, being hypocritical. We sang this song on, on bended knee earlier, and... and, and these words in here on bended knee, there, there's, a, there's a phrase in here that says, Change my life, O Holy Spirit. Make me fresh and ever new. Make my life a holy sacrifice to you. When we say, do we really mean that? You listen to those words. Change my life, Holy Spirit. When we sing that, do we really mean it? Do we, we, we really mean what we're saying? This is what we're talking about, authentic life. An authentic life. They didn't get what Paul 
later explained to the Romans. And I mean, they, they the, the, the people at that time, the religious leaders, even some of, some of Jesus' own disciples didn't get this. Paul says this later to Roman believers. He says, no, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a person's praise is not from people, but from God. He's talking about the inner heart. The life of an authentic believer. Many were just Israelites in name only. But he says to Nathaniel, he says, you are an authentic, a genuine Israelite. A man who, who, who fears God, who seeks God, who is full of integrity. His, his heart is seeking for God. He's straightforward. You know what you're going to get from Nathaniel. Right? He even said him, Philip comes up, oh, that, that can't come good. You know what you're going to get from Nathaniel. And this is a huge compliment to Nathaniel coming from the Son of God. And it's an encouragement to us as disciples that Jesus knows who we are. He, does, he knows who we were, but he doesn't focus on who we were or what we said, but on who we can become. It's also a challenge to us. It's a challenge to us to, to cast aside our prejudices like Nathaniel did and get up and follow Jesus and seek after him, to seek after God and to live authentic lives where we, where we say what we think, we live what we say. Jesus needs disciples who are true to their heart, who are authentic. One of the top objections to Christianity over and over again in surveys is they're hypocrites. They're hypocritical. One of the top objections still. And we don't like that either. We don't like people like that either. Think about it. When we know that somebody is 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 an authentic person, is a genuine person, is full of integrity, we, we warm up to them. Right? We, 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 we're willing to tell them things. We're willing to listen to them. But when we know somebody's not, we just give them kind of a cold shoulder. We're cold to them. We don't want to hear what they, what they say. And as disciples of Jesus, we want people to hear what we say. And so living that, let, that life, living that life of integrity and authenticity is, is important. But understand, though, that this is not something that can just qualify us to be his disciple. Nothing can qualify us to be his disciple. How many things do we have to qualify for in our life, in, in, in our society? You gotta qualify for just about everything, right? You gotta qualify for sports teams, you gotta qualify for a credit card, you gotta qualify for a job, you gotta qualify for a loan, you have to qualify for a health plan. That's just crazy. You have to qualify for certain auctions. You have to qualify for so many things based on your character, based on your finances, based on certain conditions and certain traits, but you don't qualify to be a disciple of Jesus. You can't qualify to be a disciple of Jesus because Jesus chooses his disciples. He chose these guys. He chose Nathaniel. He chose this guy who had this prejudice, despite his prejudice and despite his integrity, he chose Nathaniel to be his disciple. And the Nathaniels of the world are, are, are the ones that show us that no matter what the raw materials are, that it's the calling of Jesus Christ that makes us more than we can be and that qualifies us to be his disciples. Jesus knew Nathaniel just like he knows every one of us. And this knowledge of Nathaniel's character being introduced to Jesus and understanding he knows me, he knows everything about me, prompts Nathaniel to go, well, how? How do you know me? How do you know me? And Jesus' response to it reveals a little bit more about Nathaniel. Look at how Jesus proves to Nathaniel that he's an authentic person, that he knows he's an authentic person. He said, Jesus said to him, after he said, how do you know me? He says, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Then Nathanael said, Rabbi, you're the son of God, the king of Israel. Now he's been revealed to him and his faith explodes. The king of Israel, the, the, the son of God. Jesus had seen Nathanael sitting under the fig tree. Now this isn't just a reference to where he was physically, that he had this omniscience. Although that's enough. What, you saw me where I was? I and mean, that's enough to go, this guy is, knows things that's not natural. But it's, there's more to it than that. The fig tree in that culture was likely a place where people went and studied and meditated and reflected on Scripture. Uh, the houses at that time were, were, were one-room kind of uh, affair things, uh, and, and the cooking was done on the inside. And so uh, most of the time, a fire was kept going, even in, even in the summertime. And it would, get, it would get hot, it would get stuffy, and so the trees were planted around the house. 
and you would go out by the tree and, 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 and get out in, in the shade of the tree. It would be a good place to sit quietly and reflect and study your, your scripture out from the, the heat of the house. Well, fig trees were good for that. They had, they had a lot of shade. They bore good fruit that you could use. But fig trees were also symbolic of something in their time. It was symbolic of fruitfulness or spiritual fullness. And so he sees Nathaniel sitting under this tree and he goes, there's some spiritual fruitfulness that I see in you. Do you remember the time that Jesus cursed the fig tree? Where there's an incident where he curses the fig tree. Well, he doesn't curse it because he's just angry at the tree. He curses it because he sees the spiritual fruitlessness in the nation that he's come for. And that disturbs him. The fig tree was a, was a symbol of spiritual fruitfulness. And so he's revealing to Nathan not just where he came from, but that he was a man that he knew that he was a man who desired a closer walk with God and could be spiritually fruitful for the Lord. He says, I know the real you. And Nathaniel's response to that again shows his familiarity with Scripture. He uses phrases directly pulled from Scripture. Psalm 2, talking about the, the Son of God, the King of Israel. And this is the first time Nathaniel meets Jesus. And he comes to this revelation sooner than some of the other disciples do. This is the first time he meets him. And as soon as he understands that Jesus knows who he is, he's sold. He sold on Jesus. Tradition will suggest that Nathaniel will go on and he will die for his faith. He will be stuffed into a bag and thrown into the sea, and that's how he dies. He'll, he'll go into India, into Armenia, and he'll spread the message of Jesus. And it starts here with, I know who you are, and you're a man of genuine authenticity. He says to Nathaniel, I know who you are. And when people were under the fig tree, remember... It's a place of reflection, study, meditation. People expressing their heart to God. A place where you could have your, your victories and your defeats. A place where you could have your joys and your sorrows. It's a place where you could have your confidence and your doubts with God. To be under the fig tree meant meditating on God's scripture and expressing the desire to be fruitful for the, for the Lord. To seek him with all your heart with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And so this morning I invite us to sit under the fig tree with Nathaniel and with God, to sit authentically with all of our faults, with all of our sins, with all of our doubts, with all of our questions, and to invite one another under the fig tree. Invite someone under the fig tree to be with God. As we challenge and encourage one another to be the type of authentic disciples that Jesus needs in this world to continue spreading his message. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for what you reveal to us through the brief story of Nathaniel and his interaction with you and how you revealed about him what you reveal about us. Lord, how you know us so well and you take us and you accept us and you make us so much more than we even understand that we can be. Thank you for showing us so much love and mercy and, and, and desiring to, uh, to know us more and for us to know you more. Lord, I pray that your spirit will envelop us and encourage us and make us bold. In Jesus' name, amen.